My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Friday, October 28th, 2011, and I'm at the Edmund Lowe Library here in Stillwater, Oklahoma, interviewing Priscilla Decker. Priscilla is back on campus today for her 50th class reunion. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Well, let's begin by learning a little bit more about you. Could you tell us where you grew up and give us a little background into your early life? I grew up all over southern Oklahoma. My parents were teachers, and uh, they went from small community to small community in southern Oklahoma teaching, and my father was often superintendent of the school. And uh, so I ended up, all told, attending uh, like a dozen different schools as I was growing up. So I never had a hometown, as most people do. Um, when I was a junior, my parents were teaching at a small school near Ardmore. And uh, so they were always conscious that we should be in a school where we had uh, opportunities that many of the small schools didn't have. So uh, they made arrangements for me to uh, have a room in, in a woman's house that they knew in Ardmore near the school. And I, so I went my junior and senior year to Ardmore High School and graduated from Ardmore. So that was my graduation school. And actually about the middle of that year, they bought a house in Ardmore so that uh, we did actually have a house there for the rest of the time I was in school. Um, and I, uh, at Ardmore High School, my senior year, I took a journalism class and I really enjoyed it. So when I came to OSU, and I probably would have gone to Southeastern State College, which was at Durant, which is where my mother and father had gone to school. And my two older sisters had uh, gone to East Central in Ada. But uh, this journalism teacher had um, been here at OSU. And she was always urging that you know, I should consider OSU. So that was, I think, why I decided to come here, really, and um, enjoy, had enjoyed that journalism class. So I started out as an elementary education major since I was from a family of teachers. You know, that's what everybody did. Um, but I enrolled in a journalism class the first semester. And uh, Part of the, the, the lab, the class had a lab. There was a lecture in one of the old Quonset huts, which are long gone. But there was a lab to this journalism class, and that was that you spent some time one day a week at the Oak Legion. And it may have only been an hour that we were required to do. I, I don't remember now. But I got very enamored with um, the Ocali atmosphere and the people there. And uh, so I continued with my elementary education major, but taking journalism classes until the midterm of my, the middle of my sophomore year, and I changed to journalism major with an uh, uh, English minor. So that was how I really got into what was probably the most uh, the experience at OSU that probably had the most influence on, on, on my life and on my enjoyment of being here was working at the Ocali. What was it about the Ocali? Well, you know, I took up the invitation that was uh, on the flyer that I got about the uh, uh, reunion of the 61 class this year to send in something about how my story started or something like that. I don't remember the title now. And I just wrote two paragraphs. But um, I mentioned that as a lab of this journalism class, I had to be at the Ocali for a certain amount of time, once a week, I think it was. And it was the the sound of the linotype operator, or of the linotype machine over in the corner. It was the smell of the ink down in the print shop. <laughs> it was the, um, 
I was fascinated to watch the linotype machine work, the linotype operators. Um, this, the people that were on the staff, but I suppose the main thing was I liked knowing everything that was going on on campus, <laughs> mm -hmm. sometimes before anybody else. Mm -hmm. I think there was something about being in on what was happening and um, that I enjoyed it. I liked that. Do you remember your first story? Oh, it's probably, it's on one of the sheets here of my old, uh, I kept it a scrapbook. So it has clippings and it has, I was just thumbing through, the, the cover of the scrapbook has disintegrated, but uh, the pages are here. And um, on one of them is, I have noted that it was the first story on my first byline. At some point, probably the beginning of my sophomore year, I think, at that time, the Oak Legion was, and it said so on the mast, the official publication of Oklahoma State University. We were considered a real official arm of the, of the college. So there was a board of education that oversaw us, and we had a, an advisor who, he, over, he was an advisor for both the Redskin and the O'Cauley. They were both uh, put out in uh, an old two-story building that probably was condemned. It had been built in 1904 and uh, was very creaky and had wooden stairs and the old collie was upstairs and the red skin was done downstairs and the print shop was in the back for the old collie. Um, and I think it was just being a part of, of that, there was a kind of a, sometimes kind of an excitement about it to mm -hmm. be in on what was, you know, what was going on. Back to my first story, I, the, the note I had on that clipping was that it was the first story in the first byline and on the front page. And so we were set up like a regular newspaper was run at that time, which was what, what would be uh, assignments for staff members. And we covered those. We were required to go and either go to the meeting we were covering or go do an interview if we were covering a department and we had different assignments. So the first one I was given when I was on the staff, and this was before I was paid, these were paid positions if you got to a certain point. Uh, but if you were just a reporter, you weren't paid. But mine was to cover the International Relations Council and there may not be such a thing now. But that was my assignment, and they met once a week on Wednesday evening. And so this was a story covering whoever the speaker was. They had really, you know, kind of important people talking about international problems. And, and um, so there are several clippings where once a week I covered the International Relations Council, and I usually got a byline. Hmm. So that was my first byline and first story was probably from covering the International Relations Council. Then I became the first paid position I had, which I think paid $20 a month. I was glad to have it. It's <laughs> a lot of money back then. It was very helpful <laughs> at that time. Uh, was uh, was uh, the society editor. We had a mm -hmm. society section and it wasn't a whole page because we would get um, makeup of each page and of course the ad counselors got it first. I mean they had their job first was to sell the ads and they would fill in all the ads and then they'd bring then the pages would come upstairs to the newsroom and um, we would then have that whatever space to fill up that was left and it was always all the front page and then you know just parts of the other pages. And so there was usually one page that was for the society news. Like dances or? Oh, um, yes. There was particularly a column about who was uh, going steady 
and who was dropped and wow and who was engaged mm -hmm. and you identified them by their uh, sorority or fraternity uh, affiliation or if they were independent mm -hmm. by usually their residence hall and that was called the social world that was one called. And so that people would have to, you know, come up and there was a basket and you would drop in, the, you know, this little bit of information. But <laughs> and also about meet, uh, various uh, meetings or, um, yeah, dances or things mm -hmm. like that that were going on. Usually wasn't too much room, but that, that the social world was in every time. And you knew, you know, of course, what it was to be dropped. I'm, I'm taking taking it that uh, you were no longer together. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, no. This was so I'm think, that's what I was thinking. Like drop. Other like, man. This was on, on the other side. This would be where you was you were wearing the drop of whoever. That was that meant that this was kind of precursor to being engaged. Okay. Like getting pinned. Yes. It okay. Would be like that. I was thinking something totally worse. <laughs> No, it would be you could in the jewelry store in the student union, you could get little drops uh, that would be your uh, uh, sorority or fraternity affiliation. And again, those of us who didn't belong to our sorority or fraternity, mm -hmm. there was there was one that said GDI, and that was for the independence. What did that stand for? <laughs> Goddamn independence. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but that's what it stood for. That's great. That's, that's wonderful. What it stood for. Huh. I never wore one of those, you understand. <laughs> but there were people who did. But you could get around, you know, specifying that in the social world, huh. which you wouldn't want to do by just giving their uh, residence hall. Mm -hmm. But if it was a sorority or fraternity, you, you mentioned those. But, uh, but some of them did wear that kind of drop. But interesting and we're proud of it <laughs> I could tell from that time there was yes. definite yes. lines in the sand drawn yes. and, mm -hmm. right um, so you know I, I think a lot of that probably is passe anymore sure which is probably a good thing <laughs> well did you yearn for another assignment or were you fine with no, because I knew that it was a matter of working your way up, mm -hmm. and um, I was still sent out on other things, mm -hmm. was, you know, I'd, but that was my regular job. These were, were treated like jobs on a newspaper, and uh, the advisor, who was Elmer Woodson, uh, was, would be like uh, the publisher of a paper if you were working for a real newspaper. Hmm. And he served that purpose. He, uh, every morning, uh, we would, when, because we didn't come to work until early afternoon, and then, uh, and everybody who was actually on staff, uh, at least the paid staff, had to take one night a week when we were night editor to, to get it ready to be printed, which was late at night. And, um, but the next morning, Mr. Woodson would tack the Ocali up on the bulletin board up in the newsroom, and it would be marked with red for any mistakes that we had uh, of all kinds, any grammar, punctuation, spelling, uh, even comments about about how the writing was done. And I remember distinctly, and he didn't give compliments much. He was a kind of a droll man, and, uh, but he took his job very seriously, and, and we learned from it. <laughs> I remember the first time I got a red good written across something, a feature story I'd done, and he wrote good across it. And I, that, that was practically probably the only time I got got that kind of compliment on something I had done from him. Hmm. And I thought he was a tough taskmaster, but my advisor told me one time when I was kind of complaining, you know, about the, how hard it was to work for him. It was like working for a boss, and that was his job. And, um, and he said, 
when you graduate from here, you will have all kinds of different jobs. But no matter what you're doing, you will have a boss. You will have someone, you know, in that position. And he said, what you need to learn now is how to deal with that and how to, you know, make the adjustment of how to work with somebody who is giving, who is over you in authority mm -hmm. and over what you're doing and trying to, to give you advice. And that was a good, a good piece of advice. I, I thanked him many times because I went back and sucked it up. <laughs> Did you advance up the ladder? Yes, I was eventually the editor my last semester. So take me. So through I did move up. Yeah. Take me through a typical day as an editor. Well, none of them were typical. <laughs> That's why it was fun. <laughs> um, well, if there was not a whole lot going on, all I had to make sure was that uh, people were doing their assignments and were on the job. And uh, there was a sports editor who was covering the sports, and um, and then, as I said at the time, there would there was a society editor, and I think there was someone who did, even did the religious news that was in the Saturday paper. I don't know how the Ocali is done now, but we we put out a call, uh, an Ocali every it came out every morning uh, Tuesday through Saturday, except in the summer. The summer term it was twice a week. And I did work uh, on it uh, two summers, I guess. Um, but the main thing <laughs> that the editor had to do was write a column, not every day, but you were supposed to be, uh, you know, kind of knowledgeable enough to make some interesting comments about what was going on at some point or another, particularly if there was a controversy, and to cover the student senate. That was the editor's assignment. Uh, so, uh, other than that, the sort of the nitty gritty of the daily work was done by there was a, a, an associate editor and assistant editor, who's and there were two two desks right inside the front door, and uh, they were the ones who really got the paper put together because. Um, the reporters would go out and turn in whatever they had. The sports editor would make up their own page, but the uh, the, edit the two editors, and sometimes there might be only one there, but they would make up the front page, uh, dummy it in, and uh, assign the stories. We, ha we had an AP wire, so we often had national news. Well, that was another thing, you know, you could stay on top of what was happening nationally because that teletype was going all the time. I think I may have called it a linotype while ago, I meant teletype. Um, the teletype was always going. And if there was some big news, the bell would ring and we'd all go over and see, <laughs> see what it was because often it was something that affected Oklahoma State in one way or another. But sometimes it was just some big national happening. And um, so we would you know, tear, tear off the wire, the editors would, the associate or assistant editor, whoever's on, on the desk, um, and decide what to do with the wire stories. And often one of them was on the front page, but not always. Um, and then they would assign, you know, they would mark up the page where these stories were going, and then they would put on what size headline needed to go on it depending on where they put it on the page. And then that would go over to the other person and they'd write the headlines. And um, those, once, you know, it was ready, they'd be trotted down the stairs and back to the press room and the, the line of type operators came on about, seems like maybe three o'clock, I don't know. There was an older fella who was the main line of type operator and I loved to watch him do that it was hot type, and you would, you know, see these little letters, you know, that would go come down the chute and make a line, and then, you know, they'd make another line, and I don't know, it was just fascinating to watch. He was very good, and he was a lovely man, and it was nice to, and so sometimes, if it was late, um, 
and you wanted to get something in that that night, you know, you I would watch him do it uh, while he while I you know I'd take it down there and I'd just stand there and watch him type it all in, and uh, then they took the well back to what the editor did. They did cover the student senate meetings. They wrote columns. Uh, they handled letters to the editor, which came in. Um, the, they did not, not accept a, a letter unless it was signed and the person identified, but you could have the name withheld on request. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's okay. It happens. Sorry. I forgot about it. So, um, and sometimes there were kind of crisis situations. I remember I was not the editor at the time uh, when there was a, um, a kind of a problem with the um, choral festival that was held here in the I don't know whether that was like in February or sometime. And high school uh, choirs would come and there'd be a massed choir with a director who was a guest director that would come and take them, you know, through their paces and so on. Anyway, one time for the choral festival, it seems like it was right before Thanksgiving. It was that time of year. I can't remember for sure. But anyway, a bunch of these high school students just started fainting and there was this mass sort of confusion of students keeling over and so they took some of them to the armory and I don't know where else but I remember that Mr. Woodson and I went to the armory to see you know try to get the news and other members of the staff were sent out to other places, maybe some to the to Gallagher Arena. It was held in Gallagher Arena. And um, that we were very late getting, because all of us then had to come back and kind of put our stories together and make some sense out of all of this. And, and uh, it was very late getting done, but uh, Mr. Woodson did not think we did a good job of combining all our different, <laughs> I remember the next day he said we could have, you know, he had some advice about how we could have coordinated all of these stories together a little better, but they, they thought at the time that the, um, it was cold weather and that the buses that the students had come in, uh, the drivers had gone out and turned them on to be, get heat up and that the the uh, air intake had pulled in the mm -hmm. exhaust and that's they thought that's what the problem was and there weren't any serious uh, illnesses or nobody I don't think anybody was hospitalized but it was and it was probably partly a mass response that you know when some of them started fainting others went down and but that was a, you know, a big, big deal but that was something we went out and you know had had tried to have a pretty thorough coverage. And I think that was the one that the papers like the Tulsa World and the Oklahoma picked up our story on it. Hmm. Well, what were some of the other big issues of the day going on when you were in school? Um, well, I, there were, just looking back over the clippings, I. I saw two or three things. One was um, I found a clipping that I had kind of forgotten about, but there was a uh, there was kind of a controversy about a young man who was African American that was I don't remember the organization now. It was maybe a a business kind of club or something. But anyway, they were having a um, convention, state convention in Tulsa. And um, the headquarters for the convention was some, mo some hotel in 
Tulsa, some big hotel. And he had been given a room at the YWCA, I mean YMCA, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> the YMCA. And he was running for an office in this state organization. And it was someone who was well known on campus. The name was well known, familiar to me anyway. Um, and uh, he, he, uh, he left the convention and had, a had lodged a protest because they had set up his campaign sort of booth in the lobby of the hotel, and he said the other people who were running for office had suites in the hotel mm. because they were staying there. And since he wasn't staying there, they had set his up campaign headquarters up in the lobby, and he felt that that was unfair, and so he had uh, he had resigned and come back and he was protesting that. And that was on the front page of the old Collie. That story was on the front page of the Collie. And I think students today would be surprised to know that that was an issue. And whoever was president of the group said, you know, well, they felt like they had treated him equally to other people and he felt like he wasn't. And um, I think that would be something that students today wouldn't understand. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure. The, that, why that was a controversy at the time. Mm -hmm. Of course, then there was the one where, and I actually, I noticed as I walked in and saw the Edwin Lowe name, I actually interviewed him. I came here to the library and interviewed him in his office about students putting soap in the fountain. Now that might not sound like a big problem, but it was because he said it clogged up the filter and uh, they, they would just pour like a whole box of some kind of <laughs> detergent in, in it and it clogged up the filter and it uh, actually it would flood the basement and they would have to go in and completely, they take out, have to take all the mechanism apart and clean it and you know re put it back together and it was and it cost money it would, you know and it would be this fountain would be down for two or three days while they were working on it and so uh, I guess he had called and wanted to talk to somebody about it anyway I was sent over here and I, I, I talked interviewed him and wrote the story about that and then it wasn't I noticed in the clippings it wasn't but a few days later that it happened again and so I had written another one about it, and he said, he said, you know, we don't know that it's students that's doing, that are the students that are doing this, but it, they don't understand, whoever's doing it, they don't understand what a problem it is and how expensive it is and how it's, and he said if they don't, you know, if it doesn't stop, we'll just have to shut the fountain down. Wow. So that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> At the time. Mm -hmm. Apparently it's not a problem now. Okay. Apparently not, because it, it still happens occasionally. Does it? Oh, yes. Really? Yes. Okay, so that didn't didn't have much effect. No, the, we still get suds in the fountain, but not so much of the... Uh, Does it shut it down? Or? No, no. no. Mm -hmm. They've probably upgraded mm -hmm. their equipment. <laughs> oh, yes, I think so. After, uh, by now it's computerized or something. Students will be students. And, of course, even then, the engineers put green in it dyed it green during engineering engineering week. Hmm. They, it was green. I noticed today it's orange. Every homecoming. Okay. I don't think at homecoming then it was orange, but it was green for engineering week. That's interesting. You know, and when I, I was visiting with someone about the class 50 years ago being here, you know, graduated 50 years ago, I think things that I found in my box of memorabilia students don't know anything about now. We had, for instance, the mortarboard calendars. I think you, I'm sure you paid something for them, but it wasn't much, and that's how mortarboard, I think, made money. There probably, I don't know, is there still a mortarboard organization? I think there still is. Okay. That was outstanding women on campus. And um, I couldn't have lived without my mortarboard calendar. I don't know what we paid for it. it. I guess it wasn't very much, or I couldn't have afforded it. Um, but um, 
I have I found the ones from fifty nine and and sixty, and it's like having it's like a, having a diary because I noted you know things in there like when I had dates and what we did and where we went and so it's, it's, it's I'm glad I have those I don't know where the other two are but I did find those too. Also, uh, you know, in those days when I started here, we uh, we enrolled with a by hand with a an envelope actually that was uh, about um, I don't know four by five maybe it was bigger than that it might have been like five by six and. Uh, you know, we had columns where we put uh, the room number and the um, the well. There, there were different. Uh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> I can't even remember now because I'm sure you don't even use that uh, the section. Section sections. numbers. There were sections. Mm -hmm. So you put the room number, the section number, the name, uh, the instructor, mm -hmm. and where, what room it met in. Hmm. And I have those for all the semesters I was here, and I, I'm glad because I can look. And then I would note what the, who the instructor was. So I have I have noted even who who my instructors were. Would you have to turn that in or stand in a line or? Uh, yes, you did. You you filled that out, and often usually actually usually with your um, advisor, bec academic advisor, because then there was a place for them to sign down here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you would stand in line and get cards for each one of those, which we put in the envelope. And then I think when you went to the class, you gave the instructor the card. Mm. That's kind of my remembrance of that. Because I know they're envelope, they were envelopes, and I have the envelopes. And I think that you, you had to stand in line for each one of those and get a card. And if you got up to the head of the line and there were no more cards, you had to redo <laughs> the enrollment packet. Oh. You'd have to change. And because I enrolled, I didn't enroll early. I uh, just enrolled when I got here that freshman year. My that freshman English class was a five-hour class. And since I was kind of among the last to enroll, it was at 4 o'clock in the afternoon because nobody <laughs> An English class five days a week at four o'clock in the afternoon. Well, tell me where you lived on campus. Willard Hall. The whole time? Yes. What was it like living in Willard? Room, room 207 on the second floor. Mm -hmm. I had the same roommate mm -hmm. for three and a half years. I graduated in January and got married and uh, went with my husband where he was in graduate school at Purdue. So, uh, but she and I also lived together the summer before our senior year over at, um, where were we? At North Murray, I think, which was just across the street. And we were, yeah, we were in room 207 of Willard. Uh, I liked living in the dorm. I, I was fine. And it was great having the same roommate the whole time. Mm -hmm. That was good. And in fact, she's here today. She and her husband are here. We've maintained contact all these years. It's been a long-term friendship. Um, we were happened to be next door to the uh, the floor monitor. You, you heard about those? Sure. Yes. That couldn't have been good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we were. We were, on, I mean, it didn't bother us. We were on our best behavior and we, you know, we, we were okay. We weren't, you know, wild and crazy. Uh, you did have to, in your freshman year, you had to check out to go to the library. So, but all we really had, she had a kind of a um, stenographer's notebook hung on her door and you just had to put your name in when you checked out. But then she did do a hall check at 10 o'clock to make sure everybody was in. So what happens when you're late? Well, you were um, the ha seen by the house mother, I think. I don't know that that ever happened to me. But uh, I wrote in my little thing about my story, you know, how where my story began. I think that was it. That um, 
Another advantage to working at the Ocali was that, as I said before, I had to be night editor once I was really on staff, one night a week. And sometimes I would fill in for somebody who was ill or I would trade off with somebody, so sometimes it was twice a week. And um, my, by then, my fiance and I probably took advantage of that because, <laughs> because but then, you know, I had, sta had established a reputation in Willard that I went by the rules and I hadn't caused any problem with it. So um, they locked the, the back door at 10 o'clock. And so when I was working late, and if I was putting the paper to bed, it would often be 11, maybe midnight if there was some big story coming in late, or if I had covered the Senate and had to write the story and do all that. So um, my husband, my, well, my fiance at the time uh, would come often and walk me back to Willard. And sometimes we would take advantage of the fact that all I had to do was, you know, buzz the doorbell and uh, the gal from the desk would come and let me in and there were never any questions asked because they knew I was working at the Old Collie. Well, there you go. So. <laughs> Benefits of the job. Yeah. And we, you know, we didn't do that all the time, but it was, that was one of the perks of working at the Collie. Did Willard have any traditions that you could recall? Um, I don't, I don't, I'm trying to think if we even did a house decoration for homecoming, and I guess we did. But you know, since I was working at the Ocali and was often working late, I didn't get in on that sort of thing, mm. and I don't, so I don't know about that. We did have, a, our cafeteria was a public cafeteria, which was different from Murray and Stout, the other women's dorms. And um, I liked that because we had people from, particularly from Whitehurst that would come over and eat there. We, that was just across the parking lot. And at the time, I guess, I don't know whether that was the case all the time I was in Willard or not, but I know about the first two years, North Murray was uh, for uh, graduate men, and so and most of them were uh, foreign students, hmm. and they came and ate in Willard. Um, and we, my roommate and I, had some made some good friendships, just visiting with them and doing things with them. When we passed the sign for Lake Coral Blackroll, I mentioned to Joy, I said, it says fee required. I said, we didn't have to pay a fee at <laughs> Lake Coral. She said, no, we didn't. She said, I have a picture. Somebody took of me out there and I, she was talking. I said, well, I don't know. I don't have that picture. But I said, I've got a picture of when some of us went out there for a picnic all day with uh, these guys from North Murray and we had a good day at Willard, at uh, Lake Carl Blackwell, uh, just hanging out. What countries were they from? Uh, one of them was from Iran. Hmm. Uh, this was the time of the Shah over there. Um, one of them was Czechoslovakian, but he had lived in uh, Portugal. He spoke uh, Portugal. Um, or whatever they speak in Portugal. <laughs> I mean, no, not, no. He spoke Portuguese. 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 <laughs> he spoke Portuguese. Portuguese. I'll get it in a minute. Um, because his family had uh, fled Czechoslovakia hmm. at the time of the takeover there, and, uh, the Soviet takeover, and had uh, lived in Portugal. So he. He spoke that language, and then they had immigrated to, um, seems like maybe uh, Brazil or one of the South American countries, I think, Brazil. So he was actually here, uh, having come through that that route. But these were graduate students, mostly in engineering. They were mostly engineering. But through them, we met uh, uh, probably, uh, yeah, those were the two I remember most. There were others, 
but um, uh, because they ate in Willard regularly and we would visit with them. But there was a professor here who was uh, Dr. Petra Zelka, who was uh, Czechoslovakian. And he would often, I don't know, if we went to some event, he would be there, or sometimes we'd just meet in the union or something. And he was a, such a sweet man, learned and very friendly and kind. And um, I, I noticed in the pictures that there, there's one of them with him, and I just remembered what a... And there had been an article, somebody had written an article in the Ocali about him at the picture. And I, You know, I, I look at those now and I think, I wonder what happened, you know, to those people. And what, where, where they ended up, but uh, I don't know. But I like that about the Willard Cafeteria because there were other, you know, people there, and we that was we did meet people that we probably wouldn't have otherwise that we were friends with, so that was good. How was the food? You know, I didn't complain about dorm food. I know that's heretical, but I thought the food was good. <laughs> I just, I did. I thought it, I thought Willard had good food, and. That was probably partly because it was a public cafeteria, and they fed people from all over the campus, and especially from Whitehurst, mm -hmm. who came over there for lunch, and so that probably had something to do with it. But. <laughs> well, you mentioned Lake Carl Blackwell. Did you go any other places for fun? Mm, you know, I didn't have a car, and most of the people I knew didn't have a car. Nobody had a car in those days on campus. And so you were pretty much stuck on campus to do what was going on here. So we went to dances. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have pictures of, there was a Howdy dance, and there was a Sadie Hawkins dance. There was a junior-senior prom dance. Uh, I do have pictures of dances I went to. Um, the Howdy Dance was held on what was then kind of a patio on the east side of the Student Union. Long gone with the addition, I'm sure. But uh, that was right, you know, at the beginning of school. Um, what other activity? Well, we went to football games. My roommate played in the band, and uh, I enjoyed watching the band, and then, um, Actually, my husband played in the band, but I wasn't uh, dating him until he was a graduate student, and he he had he wasn't in the band, I think, after he was a graduate student. But um, one of our sons came here to uh, OSU and graduated in the December of uh, '89, and he played in the band, and so we would come up and watch football games. And that was when Barry Sanders was playing, and I was telling my roommate coming in that uh, our youngest son would come with us then. He was younger than Joel by about seven years. And he has been a fan, dedicated fan of Barry Sanders ever since. Um, anyway, back to activities we did when I was there. Mm, I don't know, I just remember the dances. There was a movie house on the corner where, um, uh, the hideaway has now taken over that corner, campus corner. Mm -hmm. But it showed, uh, you could go, it showed sort of older movies, and you could go real cheap. I think it was like a dollar or something, <laughs> I don't remember. But we went to movies there quite a bit. Although, I did, have, I did have dates at the movie downtown. I can't remember the name of it now, but there was a movie downtown. We the Leachman? Yes, yes, that's it. Um, and one of the interesting things to, for my husband and me was that we had our, I don't know whether it was our first date or not, I, I wouldn't say that for sure, but I had never had pizza before. And the hideaway opened in 1957, which was the year I came. And, um, I think I had probably gone there with other friends, but I remember that's where he and I would go for dates. 
What did you think about pizza? Oh, I thought it was good. And I, to this day, my husband and I thought that the hideaway pizza was the best. And it, there was n nothing better than the hideaway pizza. That, you know, that's, it's always, if it's your first, you always think that's the pinnacle. And so uh, when we came back for his class's 50th reunion in 2008, we had lunch at the hideaway. And we always thought it was the best. There are, you know, there are hideaways now in Oklahoma City, but, and it's good, you know. It's, we, and you know, we would analyze, why is it better than anybody? Well, we thought the crust, and then the sauce, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and in fact, um, Richard uh, Dermer was in my freshman English class. Hmm. He was an English major. Yes, right. At the time, I recall, uh, he sat on the back row, and some days he was very drowsy. <laughs> <laughs> and when I read later, or looked at his uh, interview on, on the site, I think that's where I saw, where he was telling about, or I've read it somewhere, that he was working some other job and then he and a partner started the hideaway and I mean he was you know he was working all the time no wonder he was <laughs> you know kind of barely there in that freshman English class falling asleep but uh, you can understand mm -hmm. well you, you've mentioned your husband where did you meet your husband um, I had known of him when I was in the eighth grade and actually, my two sisters knew him before I did. He uh, grew up in Ada, uh, Oklahoma, because his dad uh, taught, well, he was at head of the chemistry department at East Central at Ada. Um, and uh, Rollin attended Horace Mann School, which was the teacher training school. At that time, the state colleges, there were the six sister state colleges, and they had their own teacher training school, at least East Central did, and I think several of the others did too, on campus. And that was where the education majors would do their practice teaching. And so that's what Horace Mann was. So he went to school and graduated from Horace Mann. And when I was in the eighth grade, I lived most of that year with my oldest sister, who was a senior that year at East Central. She was a double music major, and um, she was in the orchestra, and my future husband, who was still in high school at the time, uh, played cello in that orchestra, so she knew him then. And I can remember hearing her and her friends, who were other orchestra members, talk about this kind of upstart, you know, kid who was still in high school playing in the orchestra but it was because the orchestra d director needed a cello and he knew Rollin had musical ability and so he uh, he asked him you know if he'd give him lessons if he'd play the cello in the orchestra so that's how he got started so so she knew him and then Rollin also played the clarinet in the band and my middle sister who went to East Central for two years was a twirler in the East Central band and so she knew him in the band Again, he was in high school at that time because the horse man wasn't big enough to have its own. So the, that, was, that was an advantage he thought he had going to horse man is that he, he had college instructors for some of his classes and he could play in the band and orchestra even mm -hmm. though he was still in high school. So they knew him and I went to horse man during my eighth grade year because I lived with my sister, my older sister that year. So uh, he was three years older so I just knew who he was by name. Uh, I didn't, you know, really know him. And then we reconnected here, uh, actually through the uh, student religious organizations, mm -hmm. which are probably not on campus anymore either, but at the time there were each uh, religious denomination had a student organization that was functioning. And I was Presbyterian and he was disciples. And, um, during the time that we were in college, those actually two student organizations merged. 
and we kind of came together through that. And, and uh, then he, as I said, by the time we were actually dating, he was in, doing graduate work here. And then he got uh, accepted to Purdue to uh, go straight to the PhD in chemistry there. And so he was up there one semester, and then I finished in January. We got married and went to Purdue. So, uh, so I was editor of the Old Collie that fall semester. But that was during the time, of course, when the semester ended in January. Uh, you had well, probably two weeks after you came back to school and then Ted finals. Wow. So we were married right after I finished uh, the semester in January of 1961. Well, as you're, you're going through school, do you have any ideas of what you want to be when you get older? Well, I think some people know exactly. <laughs> And uh, I, I, I told my kids, and I used to tell students when I was teaching, um, college is when you can figure that out. And so don't think that you have to go to college knowing exactly where that's going to lead, because college is the, a good time to, to try different avenues if you're not sure. And, um, and I, th I think that's what I did. I started out in elementary education and got uh, kind of veered off into journalism and English. And um, uh, now, you know, other people, our, our son who came here knew when he was in the eighth grade he wanted to do something with computers. That's when computers were new, really. And he knew from the time, you know, he was in the eighth grade that he wanted to do something with computers. So he came to OSU, but it took him three majors to get the right track for what he really wanted to do <laughs> with computers. You know, he started out in computer engineering, and then it's all that one quite right. And then he did, uh, I think he was a semester in computer engineering technology, but that wasn't it either. He didn't want to build them, you know. Uh, and then I think he was maybe made one other shift, but he ended up finally in the School of Arts and Sciences with a computer major and a business minor. And then he was right on track for what he wanted to do, and he's been, you know. So I think, uh, I think college is the time to kind of figure that out. And I think a lot of students come thinking they're aiming for something and then you know, find other avenues. Mm -hmm. and, but then then there was my husband who came and knew he was going to major in chemistry. It, uh, and he ended up teaching, which is what he thought he wasn't going to do. Mm -hmm. He was pretty clear he wasn't going to teach. And then while he was in graduate school, he discovered that that's what he really liked to do. So he spent his career teaching, you know, chemistry at Southwestern and he loved it. I mean, it was it was his calling. But he had to sort of, I think you have to be open to what's, you know, and he often said that he could have majored in music or chemistry and he decided that music could be an avocation better than chemistry could. Mm -hmm. So that's really what he did and his music was his avocation and he, he retired sooner than a lot of people do, even though he had 31 years. So he, he said, I'm, I don't want to, you know, get to the point that I can't do anything else because there are other things I want to do. So he did. He retired and he did music and, and dra uh, drama and things that he enjoyed. And so I, I think that, that college is when you can try different avenues. Mm -hmm. and see what where you really want where you're really ha happy sure so I didn't end up doing journalism per se but um, but I learned I've often said that I really learned in the practice of working for the Ocali in that work I really learned what stood me in good stead in all of my English because I later 
did some graduate work in English and, and got a master's in English education. Well, I had to write a paper, you know, in every class. And I think um, that I learned a lot from working at the Ocali that helped me in, in my English classes. And I also often said that my freshman English teacher taught me the most of what was useful when I was writing uh, for the Ocali. She was a real stickler about misspelled words, about not being redundant, about using different words so you didn't repeat a word over, you know, more than once. Uh, so choosing words, um, having a good vocabulary, being concise, mm -hmm. um, being organized, and so, I mean, she was, she taught me, I learned from her the things that really helped me probably the most in, in the writing, the journalism writing more than journalism classes, really. Mm -hmm. And I, I used that, too, all the way through when I had to do papers in English. But um, so while I didn't really end up as a journalist per se, I did for a while work at a radio station, which was a new experience. And I used my journalism for that. I covered, you know, student. Uh, city council meetings and school board meetings and uh, reported on elections and but I hadn't ever worked at a radio station so that was kind of interesting but I was I thought I was just I considered myself a journalist mm -hmm. part-time <laughs> it, it goes hand in hand it transfers the skills yeah, transfer yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and and I I got them here so I was I was you know satisfied with my my classes and the work that I did here. Did you ever end up in the classroom teaching yourself? I did, finally. At the age of, I said at the age of 40, I had a midlife crisis and started teaching school. <laughs> but um, when my husband uh, began teaching at Southwestern in Weatherford, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, you know, at that time, I had spent, while he was in graduate school at, at uh, Purdue, I had worked at the university editor's office, which was the office for Purdue that uh, published all of their, their publications, catalogs. Mm -hmm. They had a little in-house magazine. I wrote for that and, and so on, um, and did a lot of editing of materials and, and bulletins and publications that were put out through that office. Uh, then, when he got the job at Southwestern in 1965, um, I realized that there wasn't going to be much opportunity in Western Oklahoma for for me. The only journalism jobs were working for small town newspapers, and uh, the local newspaper wasn't interested in hiring me. And frankly, I wasn't too interested in working for him anyway. So that's all right. Um, so I started, um, they did, the, the college did that one year, the first year, they did know I had a journalism degree and the man they had hired to teach journalism uh, left right at about the time school was starting. And that was during the boom of Southwestern. They were growing mm -hmm. uh, uh, leaps and bounds. So they asked me to come in on a temporary part-time basis and teach the journalism classes and sponsor the yearbook newspaper. So I did that at Southwestern that one year. But in the middle of that year, we adopted our first child, and so we kind of started on our family. Um, so I saw that probably I wasn't, there wasn't going to be much opportunity for, for journalism work um, out there. So I started taking classes to get a master's in, in English ed, which I did. And during that time, I worked, I edited a weekly advertiser paper for a, for a few months, and then I worked at the radio station part-time. And uh, in getting the master's, I worked off a teaching certificate. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really actually apply for, uh, until my youngest child uh, started kindergarten when he was 
when he was five, I sent out applications, and I, I started teaching at Clinton Public Schools. But I only taught uh, freshman English there for six years, and they opened up a position in the superintendent's office for someone to do public information for the schools. Mm -hmm. Right up your alley. And I, yeah, I, this is really, that was my perfect job. I did really like that, and I did that for 14 or 15 years until I retired. Mm -hmm. And that was, it grew to be more than, when it started out, I, that, that was really what I was doing. I was doing publicity for them, and I was taking lots of pictures. They bought a camera. I took pictures and I wrote stories and I, they were all in the you know local paper and I already knew the school system and I knew the teachers and I you know I would be in all the classrooms and I knew new programs and it was great fun. I did brochures and everything, but um, somewhere along the line the assistant superintendent uh, needed my help to do things like grant proposals and so on because he wanted he wanted me to help write some of his stuff and I began to help him and I took on more and more of kind of assisting him and then when he became superintendent he kind of divided his job between me and, uh, and the high school principal and um, I really became more of an administrator then and I, I took on more administrative work. Are there any places on campus that are just really special to you when you when you think about them? Oh, the student union. We used to go over to the student union for coffee from the Oak Holly. We'd take a break and go over there, particularly at night, if we were working at night. Um, the, the dance floor up on fourth floor, there was a jukebox, and it was nearly always going, because somebody was nearly always up there. And, um, we, you know, I'd go up there with somebody and we'd dance. Um, Willard, that our room at Willard Hall, <laughs> that was home for, you know, the time I was here. Theta Pond, I always thought that was pretty. And it was a peaceful place mm -hmm. to just go. And, and of course it was near Willard, uh, near Willard. Um, the hideaway for pizza, <laughs> it was in a little storefront place, very different from where it is now. Very small, really. Um, those are, the, and of course the Ocali offices. I, I saw in, the, in that book about the growth of the campus it's something entitled OAMC, something about the growth of the facilities or something over the years from the beginning, that that building was actually torn down just probably a couple of years after I graduated, hmm. not long after I graduated. It had been the creamery for the dairy herd. Hmm. And that's what it was built for in 1904, <laughs> but it suited the Ocali well because it had, there is a picture in, in this book that I have that shows the equipment for when it was the creamery and of course on the concrete floor there were these huge various kinds of containers and machines and whatever. And they needed that, that heavy concrete floor to put the press on. And uh, so the press was on, on the concrete floor at the back of, the, of it. So it, it, it was an old building, but I enjoyed the time I was there. I did, I was gone one time overnight for something. I think they had a shower for us after I was engaged in Ada and I was gone overnight. And when I came back, there was some kind of a big to do because there had been a, some kind of a panel, again, I think, in Tulsa. And one of the foreign students from OSU had said something that infer, that we inferred from, somebody inferred from what he said, that OSU was not friendly to foreign students. 
And so I just, I came back, you know, late and went to work and I was so tired. And here was this parade of people bringing letters to the editor. And, and of course that was the semester I was editor. And complaints and I, I, that was the most stressful time I can recall. <laughs> That was, it was the only time that I went into the bathroom, which was at the back of that top floor, and cried because I was so frustrated that all this had broken loose and I wasn't here, you know, so I didn't really know what was going on and all these people were in an uproar over whether OSU was friendly to their foreign students or not. And of course I had friends who were foreign students. And, um, but that was the only time I remember not handling it well. Um, but, you know, as I said, we were, I, I particularly, I didn't have a car, so I would have to sort of bum rides, you know, home with people. And, we, and nobody wanted to stay until I got out of English class at five o'clock. <laughs> that was always a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I would either have to cut class or, or they wait on me. But um, what was homecoming like when you were a student? Oh, actually, pretty much, I think like it is here. I do guess that Willard had some kind of decoration because it was always on that west side of the building. And our room was on the west side, on the second floor, and I can kind of recall that there would, you know, our window would be covered up, I think. But as I said, I never got in on that particularly because I was working at the paper. And that would be a busy time for us. Oh, yeah. You know, really. So, um, but I think the uh, house decorations were not as uh, sort of, over the top elaborate as they are now. Uh, for one thing, they didn't have all the uh, mechanical stuff that they do now, and uh, all the extra power and so on. But there were some pretty elaborate things done. And I, you know, I always went to parade. Well, I started to say that I didn't. Yeah, I probably did, always. I probably did go to the parade because I knew people in the band. Well, you started in '57, mm -hmm. so you were around when Pistol Pete became the official mascot. Yes. Was that a big deal? I don't recall that particularly. Although I remember we had articles about the original man that it was based on. I kind of remember that there was, you know, he was, in fact, I think now that I kind of think back on it, I think he was the uh, marshal of one of the parades, probably while I was here. Mm -hmm. The carillon was a favorite thing while I was here. I just now was hearing it. I loved to hear that. And I still do when I'm here. I like it. I love that. Would it that play was, anything different? Yes. On Sunday afternoons, it would play things. I guess hymns. I don't remember for sure. But uh, it seems like there, it would play a little while on Sunday afternoon. I don't remember other times, although there might have been when it played songs. I, I couldn't. I couldn't remember that. I can't remember that for sure. But I know on Sunday afternoon sometimes it, it did play things. Uh, I like the Caroline. I like that. I like it during the holidays. It'll play uh, Christmas music. Yes, yes, right. So I was trying to think. It seems like maybe special times sometimes mm -hmm. it would play things. But I don't know. Did you spend much time in the library? Yes. Oh, yes, I, I was in the library. Because as I said, it's when we were freshmen, we could mm -hmm. check out to the library. But you had to say that's where you were going and you weren't supposed to go anywhere else. <laughs> we were trustworthy, weren't we? Did it look much different? I do think maybe sometimes we went over to the Union for coffee. But <laughs> Did the library look much different? or? Well, yes. I was telling my roommate uh, 
the other day, well, after they got here, I said, when I said, you know, you might want to come over and look at the library, I said, for one thing, there are computers all over the place. <laughs> there were um, stacks. I mean, you know, you, you, I had, I had a humanities class, and a lot of the things we had to read were on reserve, and you'd have to go uh, in the reserve stack and find what you wanted. And I don't know, do they still have monitors that wander through periodically to see if... Not really, not that I know of. doing what you're supposed to be no. doing and not bothering anything? No. <laughs> We have security, but I mean. All right, but do you still do they still check your books as you go out? We uh, check books at circulation, and they only check you if you go out if you make the doors ring. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. There was usually a uh, a man who was at the desk between the two front between the front doors, or mm -hmm. are there two desks between the. There front are. Front? Seems like maybe there was one at each, mm -hmm. and they they were they were more suits and you know they must have been graduate students I'm guessing, and you had to put all of your material up there and they would thumb through it, hmm. books if you had uh, things in a bag you had to empty it and uh, if it was just a book and a notebook they would thumb through it. Wow, and then they would. Uh, they or someone in their group would periodically kind of wander through the floors. And up on the fifth floor, there were study carols for graduate students. And I think they were assigned certain ones. But we would go up there with them, and it was quiet, and there wasn't much activity. And we would, you know, use one of the unused study carols. But one time, one of the monitors said we shouldn't be up there, hmm. that we weren't graduate students and we didn't belong up there. Do you remember if you could wear pants in the library? Women? I guess so, because I don't remember that being, uh, I'm sure I wore, I'm sure I must have worn pants some, and I don't remember that being anything. Was that at some time? At some point. At some point you could have Boy, I don't, rem I don't remember that being a thing to bother about. I really don't. But then we did wear skirts a lot more then than, you know, than they do now. I, isn't that interesting? I can't remember that. You probably would have remembered. I think so. But I came from a high school where you could not wear pants to school. Hmm. You, you could, on Fridays, on Fridays at Armour High School, when I was a senior, you could wear slacks, but not jeans. You couldn't wear jeans, but you could wear slacks. And I think, I think that was only on Fridays. I think I'm right about that. But hmm. So, you know, that wouldn't have been a big deal, I guess, if that was the case. Well, looking back, how did attending Oklahoma State really impact your life? Oh, well, I think my life would have been very, very different if I hadn't attended Oklahoma State. You know, we were the first class that graduated when it was OSU for all four years. Mm -hmm. And my husband had been in the first class that graduated as OSU. It had been OAMC when he started. And then, and then yeah, our class was the one that OSU the four couple years. And we all had to adjust to at the football games, you know, because OAMC doesn't fit the wave. I mean, OSU, I'm sorry. OSU does not fit this as well as OAMC. Right. So that, you know, that was kind of an adjustment for him. Um, well, I wouldn't have had the experience of working at the Ocali, which is my most significant, I suppose, uh, memory of being here, and really probably impacted what I did later a great deal, and whatever it was. and. Um, I did, you know, 
date my husband here. I didn't actually meet him here, but we started knowing each other here. And um, that would probably not have happened if I'd gone somewhere else. So it was uh, a major, I think, impact on my life. And I've always been proud of it. I think Oklahoma State's pretty unique that uh, students and alumni have this great uh, loyalty towards yes. campus. What What do you think is it about OSU that sparks this loyalty? Hmm. That's interesting. Okay, I have to tell you what. I think part of it is that at least at the time I was here, I don't know whether most of the students, but my sense in that is that maybe I could say most of the students came from small towns. And I do remember, I happen to have, this is my husband's OSU ring. I don't recall that he ever wore it very much, but I found it in some things. And I don't, I think, I don't remember, he may have worn it his year, last year here or something. But anyway, and I, when I found this, I recalled, and of course, about the time I graduated from high school, I said, well, that was the thing to do. You wore your boyfriend's ring, you know, on a your neck, on a chain. Um, but I remember when I came and they had this orientation session. And one of the things they told us was, take off your high school graduation ring and leave it at home. Because, you know, you're now, everybody's part of OSU, and so there's, you're not identified by, by that anymore. And I, I, I thought of that when I saw this ring. But um, I think the fact that so many of the students, and I, I would think maybe most at the time I was here, came from small towns. And they, most of them didn't have cars. So you had to become a part of the campus and that sort of meant that you made friends and you, you joined organizations and you uh, did things together. You went to football games and dances. Um, and so you, I think you felt like you were kind of a, a, a part of a group, a certain group that was connected by being from o, being at OSU and from OSU. And I, that's all. That's a, that would be all I'd guess that it was. I don't know. I don't know. But you know, I noticed, uh, for instance, when we, when my husband taught at Southwestern, by the time all students had cars, a lot of them commuted, mm -hmm. and um, if they had cars, they went home every weekend, and that I think makes a difference. And when I was a student here, you were, you were here, and so who, whoever you came in contact with was part of whatever you were doing, and I don't know, maybe that was it. But if that's still happening, and students have cars now, maybe that doesn't <laughs> follow. I don't know. Maybe it's just something about I Oklahoma don't State. Don't know the answer to that. <laughs> you know, and maybe it's because Oklahoma uh, Stillwater is isolated from mm -hmm. a large metropolitan area. I think maybe that's part of it. Could be. I don't know. It's an interesting question. Well, as we wind down today, is there anything you'd like to mention that I have failed to ask you? Anything you'd like to say? I think I've covered <laughs> everything <laughs> and taken enough of your time. Well, welcome back. I'm sure when I leave here, I'll think, oh, I wish I had told her something. Well, we're back with Priscilla Decker, and you're going to tell me a little bit about Varsity Review. Are you involved with that? I remembered, uh, yes, that... Varsity Review was took up a lot of my time. Um, what was Varsity Review? Varsity Review was a variety show that had acts and individual, it had group acts and individual acts. And you uh, had to audition. It was sponsored at the time I was here by the two journalism uh, 
groups, honorary journalism. The uh, Theta Sigma Phi was the girls, and I believe I'm right that the men's was Sigma Delta Sigma. I don't want to say the <laughs> the fraternity, but it was uh, some something Sigma something. I'm kind of foggy on that, but um, they sponsored uh, that Barst Review. It was in the spring, and you had to. Uh, there was a committee, a Barst Review committee, that was made up of members of these two journalism groups, and there uh, that the committee would. I think choose a director for the Vars Review, and then there were committee members that were in charge of different things. So the committee would audition groups and individuals. And also, there were girls who would audition to be the Vars Review girls. And they were like the um, Rockettes, Radio City Music Hall. And they would wear lovely short costumes and they would introduce the Varsity Review and then I think they would maybe introduce the second act and um, so it was it was a real big undertaking mm -hmm. and um, and then they sold tickets and that's that was just it was a money maker but it was very popular and it was very well attended and um, many of the uh, sororities and fraternities would would try out for their group act and uh, sometimes the residence halls would. the year I think that I was assistant director Thatcher Hall I believe had an act <laughs> and actually my future husband was in it but I don't think we were going together at the time I, uh, I don't remember I, I couldn't tell you exactly and the varsity review would have a theme of some kind this committee would decide on the theme, and so the acts would fit the theme some way. It might be kind of off the wall, but it would be some relation to the theme. And then the individual acts would perform in front of the curtain while you were changing for the next group act. And uh, anyway, I think, I guess, it was, I think it was Thatcher that, that uh, it was one of those smaller men's dorms and all I remember is that they wore togas made out of bed sheets, and they were, it was like the lost, um, you know, the lost, uh, not country, but uh, under the sea, anyway, it was, <laughs> it was all strange, I did not. Anyway, they, <laughs> no, they wore togas made out of bed, she bed sheets with ropes around their waist. <laughs> but, um, some of the acts were, were pretty elaborate, and usually they involved music, and they would usually write an original, you know, song. Somebody in their organization would be a music major, and they, and uh, but it was a lot of work for those of us who did it. And I was assistant director one year, and then I was the director the next year. And Where did it take place? In the auditorium. In Williams Hall, or uh, no, no, it have been. Mm -hmm. No, it's it was um, what was that? It's actually the Seratian Center incorporates what was the old auditorium. Okay, I think I think I read that. I believe I'm right about that. Okay, it was kind of built around so that, and I think the auditorium was completely renovated or re restructured, mm -hmm. rebuilt. But that no, that's where it was held, and it was uh, you know alums would come back and parents of kids that were in it. it was, it was a big production, yeah. and um, you know you'd have to have lighting. And I, <laughs> I remember one year, and I don't know whether that might have been the year I was the director. And there would, you know, you'd have rehearsals every night for I don't know two weeks beforehand or something. But somebody designed as the opening uh, when the curtain first opened at the opening scene a fountain in the middle of the stage and some engineering you know student helped I'm sure with this and uh, but it was hooked up some way so that when the curtain opened the you know this water would flow out of the fountain, lovely fountain but it was hooked up of some way to the water supply I don't know so that to make it work you had to 
flush the stool in the bathroom in the wings. <laughs> so you had, you know, somebody had to time it just right that whoever was working the curtain would say they, you know, were ready or whatever. And there would there was somebody kind of down the hall that would holler at whoever was in the bathroom, you know, flush the stool. <laughs> and then the fountain would you know, it was lovely. <laughs> but you had to have someone back there telling them when to flush the stew for the water to come up. You stayed quite busy. Yes, it was. Uh, it was fun. I, I don't know, you know, what I learned from that except how to work with a lot of people to get something on the stage. I, I don't know now, but uh, and sometimes there were fusses going on, you know, between groups, and so you know, they didn't like where they were placed or, you know, somebody else was getting better timing or, I don't know, it was, uh, it was nerve wracking. But it was another learning experience of how to get along with a lot of people and keep them from, you know, fighting each other. But first review was, I don't know how long it went on. I, it hasn't been I don't know. I'll have to look that up. It hasn't been going for quite a while, I think. But mm -hmm. um, that was it was it was one of the things we did, and it was one of the reasons I didn't, you know, have as good a grade point average as I could have. But I had a three point three, so I, I I was all right. <laughs> Not too uh, good enough to graduate. Good enough to to <laughs> graduate. That's right. And where was graduation held? Well. It was, I think, you know, I think it was in at what was called then Lewis Field, but then I didn't come back for graduation, so I wasn't here for graduation because I finished in January and got married right after I finished in January and uh, went right away up, back up to Illinois, uh, Indiana with my husband, and uh, so I didn't come back for graduation. But I think it was on Lewis Field at that time, what we called Lewis Field. Mm -hmm. It's not that anymore, but that's where I think it was. Would you would you do anything differently from your college days if you could go back? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Well, that's a good thought. What would I do differently? Probably I would, but I don't know right now, looking back, what, what I would do differently, I, except maybe work harder at my classes. <laughs> but you know, I didn't, I mean, I, I went to class and I had good teachers and I took good notes. I still have the notebook. I kept the notebook from my intermediate algebra class because I enjoyed that class a lot. And a graduate student taught it, and I thought he was a great teacher, and I enjoyed the class so much, and I still have that notebook just because I enjoyed it. So I don't know if I had to, if I had spent more time, you know, doing studies, I couldn't have done all the extra stuff I did. So. And that was a big part of my, you know, college experience. And I came out with a good education, and I remember some really good classes and some good, really good teachers. Any in particular you'd like to share? Well, sure. I, could, I mean, I could name a few. You. I, I mentioned uh, Dr. Kroll, who I had a couple of English classes with. I thought he was very good. Uh, my freshman English teacher was really just an adjunct teacher who I think she later taught at Langston University. Her name was Mrs. Flash. I remember her name, and she might have been a graduate student or something. I don't know, but she was very good and, and had really uh, a, a good she gave me good, you know, help with writing that I used in journalism and, and my English classes and everything. Um, 
Mr. Stratton was a journalism teacher that I had for several journalism classes, and he was an interesting person. Um, we used to quote him up at the old collie all the time about how, you know, a group of orangutans put out the kind of paper we put out <laughs> that day or something. I mean, he was, he was pretty hard on us sometimes. Um, but he, he did a uh, jazz after hours or something like that program on the radio station that was uh, popular. He knew a lot about jazz, and, uh, and my husband used to listen to it because he liked jazz. Um, he was an interesting person. And, um, mm, uh, who else comes to mind? I can't think right quick. Uh, I had a Dr. May for a uh, cultural anthropology class that was very interesting. And you know, some of these, I didn't, I didn't make A's in them, but I used to tell students, you know, don't try so hard to get straight A's that you miss out on classes that might give you more in the long run. That you'll, that'll have a more impact on what you do later or on, you know, what you want to learn. Because uh, some of the ones that I had that I think I still remember, I didn't do as well in as I did in some others. But, so I used to, you know, give that advice to students. Don't, don't pass up what you think is a hard class that you probably can't make an A in just because you want to get straight A's. Because you'll miss out on some good preparation for college. And, uh, I, you know, I was thinking of something a while ago, and now it's, it's left me all of a sudden uh, that I was, I don't know, now it's, I can't bring it back up, um, that I was thinking about as far as one of the classes I had, but I've lost it. Well, it's pretty good advice. <laughs> it's a good way to end. Thank you. Thank you once again.